Okay, it's two o'clock and um, I would like to welcome everyone to this uh, webinar um, on the Nordic know-how series, a report series, where this is the seventh uh, chapter on cooling systems for hospitals. Um, this event is um, um, hosted by Nordic Center for Sustainable Healthcare. But with this um, chapter, we also invited our colleagues at the Belloc uh, Network to do this as a collaboration. And the um, report is also financed by the Swedish Energy Agency. Um, yeah, my name is Johannes Brandin. I'm working for Nordic Center for Sustainable Healthcare. Uh, and this is uh, the program for today. Uh, I will start to say that this uh, event will be recorded and uh, we will use it as uh, material for, that we'll upload to our webpage as a YouTube um, video. So you can go and look at the content uh, later as well. So we will start with an introduction and a presentation of the report. And uh, this will be done by us at Nordic Center for Sustainable Healthcare. Then we'll leave the stage to our colleagues at CIT who are running the Belloc network. They will give an introduction and uh, uh, do a presentation of their uh, res um, survey among the Swedish hospitals. And then we'll listen to um, five uh, member companies in our network that provide uh, technologies that are interesting for uh, interesting cooling technologies uh, that are tested and, and implemented in, in the hospitals. And in then we'll hear from the Belloc network about the total methodology for how to implement cooling and then energy efficient uh, systems. And then in the end, we'll have time for questions and answers. You can either uh, ask your um, questions in the chat or uh, speak in, in the end of, of the, this session. Yes, so um, Nordic Center uh, is behind this uh, webinar and um, we are, um, it's a network with about 120 uh, organizations. It's a, a cross-sectorial network um, and we include everything from hospitals, companies, universities, and the different organizations that have interest in sustainable healthcare. And we believe that you need to work uh, over the borders you know, or the traditional silos to approach this uh, challenge that we have. Um, and our uh, aims are to raise the awareness of sustainable healthcare, boost innovation and investment in sustainable healthcare, bring world-class solutions and ideas to the Nordics and deliver Nordic uh, solutions and knowledge to the world. So we started this as a Nordic uh, network, but now it's uh, more of an international uh, character, so to say. So we, we uh, are happy to work with our colleagues uh, and partners around the world. And part of this uh, mission, we are doing different projects and initiatives and uh, this report series is now, um, th this uh, chapter is uh, uh, within uh, the platform for internationalization on energy and climate smart healthcare, which is financed by the Swedish Energy Agency. And within this platform, we share knowledge and best practices from Swedish hospitals, showcase what technologies are available today. So that is, can be implemented. Um, and we do uh, initiate collaboration between Swedish and international uh, partners. And this we do like conferences, workshops, pre-studies, projects, and study visits, and, and so on. Um, and Nordic Know How series is um, now uh, have made six uh, of them, and it has been uh, nitrous oxide destruction, geothermal energy, lighting, ventilation, renewable energy production, and district heating. And what we want to do with this uh, reported series is that we saw that during the, the pandemic, it was hard to travel and so on, but the, the demand uh, uh, for information and knowledge uh, about technologies was still there. So we looked into a new 
communication uh, channel. So we uh, want to make information about the Nordic best practices available in English, because most of it today is hidden in, in the regions and, and within the hospitals in, in Swedish or, or other Nordic languages. And we also want to make it more Googleable. So if someone around the world is searching for solutions, they will come to, to our uh, sources. Um, yeah, so the, we ended up with the Nordic Know How uh, report series. And uh, it's a short, the, yeah, these are short reports on specific topics aimed uh, for an international audience. Uh, it's an introduction to, to the topic, gives you an idea on, on uh, how to approach it. And then you, of course, need to deep, uh, dive deep into our, the references that we provide as well. And uh, it should be available technologies and principles that are tested and are working at hospitals today uh, and based on pra best practices from Nordic hospitals. And we do webinars um, uh, with the hospital representatives and technology providers to, to give you the expertise uh, on this topic, both from the user side and also from the technology provider side. And it should also be a gateway to, to the Nordic know-how. And um, yeah, so the reason why we do this uh, webinar today is because we're releasing the seventh uh, chapter in, in this series, and it's about cooling system for hospitals. And uh, this uh, we, we will provide the, the report after uh, the, uh, the webinar. Uh, but now I will leave the stage to my colleague, who uh, Diego, who will do a, a, yeah, a presentation of, of the report. Hi, thank you very much to my colleague, Johannes Berendin. Uh, good afternoon to the people from Europe. Good morning to the people who are joining from the, the American continent and good night also because uh, we have people from Asia. Welcome to this webinar. And as uh, Johannes says, uh, this uh, report has been a collective effort to present one of the most challenging topics uh, within healthcare right now. And what, uh, why is that? Uh, I think that you already know, like uh, months ago, part of the breaking news was this heat waves all around the world. And we know that climate crisis will um, increase this kind of uh, phenomena. And in practical terms, that means that the strategic infrastructure should be like uh, adapt uh, and especially a strategic infrastructure so, such as healthcare facilities. Uh, more than the, that just like be an strategic infrastructure, the calling system is, uh, is all across the uh, healthcare sector. We know that temperatures is uh, impact the comfort of the people, is key for the healing of a patient, is key for the comfort of the, and the performance of the, spa, of, of the staff, is key for the preservation of medicines, of samples, of tissues. So we know that it's a, a quite a challenging issue. Uh, so following the uh, spirit of the Nordic know-how series, as uh, Johannes just explained it, we try to address this complex and practical issue to practical and complex ways. So what we want to do is um, share learning through in a, in a peer learning process. We want that hospitals learn from the experiences of another hospitals. And that is the main purpose of the, of the report. We want to improve the sustainability performance of the hospitals and healthcare facilities but it's not just possible through theoretical frameworks of just to the revision of the concepts. We want to know from the experiences. So what you will find in this report, and sorry uh, to disappoint you a little bit because I don't go, I, I will not go like in detail into the report because we want to, that you discover the report, that you use the report uh, hand in hand with the, uh, with the first six report. But when I can tell, is that you will find the concepts and the techniques supported by real life experience. We will, you will find like um, the most um, 
used techniques in terms of cooling, from passive cooling, free cooling, mechanical cooling, district heating cooling. Uh, you will uh, find like a deep uh, typology about the different kinds, but the most important is that you will find best practices. Uh, for the elaboration of this report, we use the experience uh, and supporting by the team of CIT, the experience of hospitals through interview service, they will explain it like uh, more in detail. So you will find like best practices and a broad analysis of what is going on, what is the state of the art in the cooling systems uh, in Sweden. And most important, you will find a call of action, a call for collaboration, because sustainability transformation is not possible without cross-sectorial collaboration. And that is what you will find in this report. Even this report is result a profound collaboration between the Nordic Center for Sustainable Healthcare, CIT, supported by the Swedish Energy Agency. So please use the, the, the report. Uh, uh, the, uh, you will receive it uh, after the event. Download the, the fixed report. Use it as a practical library in your hospital, in your healthcare facilities. Use the reference that uh, you use it. And remember, go to our webpage, nordiccsh.org. Uh, so you will find all the reports and other material that we have elaborated in the sustainable healthcare topic. You will find the agenda for the, our next events, trainings, webinars, and please also go to World Greenest Hospital that you can find more solutions, sustainable solutions, not just for the cooling system, but also another challenges within healthcare facilities. So, uh, I will, uh, as you notice in the in the program, we are short on time. So I think that we can go deep into the topic uh, in the question and answer sections. So now I want to give the floor to Karen Glader and Victoria Hedenhofer from uh, CIT that will explain a little bit more about the practical perspective that this report used for uh, for his elaboration. So please, uh, Karen, uh, uh, Victoria. Thank you. Uh, I will just try to share my presentation. Can you see it? Yes, thank you very much. Yes. Good. Uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Victoria, and I work together with, with Karin at uh, CIT Energy Management. And uh, we coordinate a focus area called energy efficient care facilities within BLOC, which is a network between Swedish non residential real estate owners. And uh, the organization is initiated and supported by the Swedish Energy Agency. And uh, Karin will tell you more about this later. So, as you already know, the current world situation and the climate issue has put a focus on the question of energy. And uh, I hope to inspire you to continue the important work with energy issue by telling you about some experiences from cooling of Swedish care facilities. And to collect opinions and experiences about cooling systems in care facilities, a survey was uh, carried out with answers from 15 different counties. And in order to further evaluate the use of cooling in Swedish hospital, some of the respondents were contacted for an interview. And in the map uh, here of Sweden, yeah, you can see the distribution between survey answers and uh, the interviews. And the responses shows that cooling is most common in operating theaters where over 85% responded that uh, they always use cooling. Cooling is also common in uh, intensive care units and in other health care departments. The responses also show that the mechanical cooling or compressor cooling is the most common way to produce cooling for health care facilities, followed by free cooling and the district cooling. Only one county indicated the use of absorption cooling, and uh, the county representative that answered other 
said that they have uh, cooling heat pumps in combination with the boreholes, uh, which by other is considered as free cooling. And most of the respondents believe that their cooling systems work well in operating theaters. For other pre premises, uh, such as intensive care units and the public areas, the answers vary, as you can see. And based on the interviews, it is shown that uh, the work with cooling focus on three main areas, namely production, distribution and need. And regarding production, uh, the interviews concluded that cooling in hospitals today is mainly produced by district cooling or local mechanical cooling. And many highlight the advantages of district cooling in that it is often easy to install and require less maintenance. However, it works best if there is already a fairly centralized cooling system in the hospital. And the disadvantage of district cooling is that you become dependent on your supplier. Uh, some have clear strategies for which cooling systems to install, while others that mine on a case-by-case -case basis and adapt to local conditions. For example, some describe that they are trying to avoid using electricity for cooling due to problems with capacity levels of electricity. Uh, it was pointed out that they try to have mechanical cooling only as a backup alternative. And regarding robust systems, the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency, or MSB in Swedish, uh, requires that the Swedish hospitals have high resilience, which poses a challenge to the cooling system. More proactive actors are increasingly looking for solutions that are flexible and where the system can be supplied in different ways. Some advantages mentioned with centralized systems are that it is easier to recover heat and require less maintenance. However, it requires that the cooling can be adjusted to the specific need in different buildings to limit overcooling. Local backups are often required for sensitive processes. Um, most of the interviewed prefer airborne cooling, thus there is considered to be a limitation in the cooling capacity since you want to limit the air flows due to other comfort aspects and energy demand. The disadvantage of the shield beams on the other hand is that they can be difficult to clean, especially older models, and that there are problems with the condensation during hot and humid periods. However, there are environments where shield beams can be a good alternative especially if the air flows are lower and in dark draft sensitive environments. Uh, it's recommended to separate the systems for process cooling and comfort cooling, if possible, since process cooling often is needed 24 hours a day, all year round, while cooling in general is more seasonal. And during construction of buildings, many of the respondents' organizations focus on energy efficiency. In some cases, goals are set to achieve a certain level within environmental certification systems. Several work with solar shading to reduce the need for cooling. It's important to choose a good technology with flexibility. And for example, it may be wise to divide the sun shading into several zones to avoid the risk of it blocking use when not needed. And there are also several ways to minimize cooling needs in existing buildings. For example, selection of windows such as um, G-value and planting trees that contribute uh, to solar shading, etc. And also, instead of adapting the climate system to the building, you can adapt the building to the climate system. Uh, for example, it's possible to take into account how much heat and cold that can be produced with existing or intended systems and design the building based on this. It can, for example, include smaller window sizes and uh, reviewing the orientation of the building so that more heat sensitive activities are located in the north. Uh, 
and a glimpse of what's next. Uh, so the demand for cooling is increasing within Swedish society. Uh, it's described to be more difficult to achieve the temperature level users are used to due to heat uh, waves influenced by global warming and increased demands on the indoor climate. There are also higher energy ambitions and environmental standards. And one example is the FGAS regulation from EU that will phase out refrigerants with high environmental impact. Um, and I will just end by telling you about uh, that there are more in, uh, information in the report. And as uh, Diego already said, uh, we want you to read the, the report. So I won't go into detail about this, but in the report, there are more, more detailed description of how different hospitals tackle some of the challenges. And uh, as Diego already said, the report will be published both at the uh, NCS, uh, both at both BLOX and um, NCS H web page. Yes, that was everything I had to say. Thank you, Victoria. <laughs> cool, right? Thank you. So uh, yeah, uh, as uh, we said, cooling system is across the healthcare facilities. There is like an increasing need to adapt the systems, the existing systems. There is the need to uh, uh, improve the distrib distribution of cooling all around the healthcare um, and minimizing the need and look for the more efficient technologies. And with that in mind, we invite today to some companies who will present uh, their solutions in terms of cooling systems. So the, I, I will give the floor to my colleague uh, Johannes, who will drive us to, to these companies, into these solutions. And again, thank you very much to CIT for the amazing collaboration. And we were looking forward to everyone to read the report. Thank you very much. Yes, so <clears throat> yeah, so a, a part of, of this concept is to um, to give you the different aspects of, of um, different experts in, in this field. Uh, so that's why we would like to represent um, five of our member companies. Uh, who will give you a short presentations on, on their technologies and how they are implemented in, in the hospitals. Um, so first out, I would like to introduce Per Olsson from Link Architecture, Link Architecture uh, in Swedish, um, who will give us the architect's perspective of cooling of hospitals. Welcome, Per. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Johannes. Um, well, uh, tooling and, and architecture is, is very much about, as we uh, heard, uh, lowering the need of, of tooling actually. Um, and the uh, Link Ar Architecture is a architecture firm that works with sustainability in general, but we also work with uh, climate smart architecture. So we have a great focus, especially on initial carbon emissions. When we design our projects, and uh, today I will give you two things that I would like you to bring with you from this presentation. It's uh, don't forget the initial carbon emissions when looking at cooling installations and also uh, secure that we don't let too much heat into the building. These are the two messages that I will present on. Uh, so the first one, don't forget the initial carbon emissions from mechanical cooling. Uh, it's really important that we not only focus on the energy part of cooling, but also look at the initial carbon emissions from mechanical cooling, because we can see that the temperature is rising and it's rising quick. And therefore we have to handle much of the uh, carbon emissions that happen in a close uh, uh, future uh, and take away a, lot, a, a large part of that. 
And uh, therefore, it's important not just to look at life cycle carbon, but also on initial carbon. And uh, it's not, uh, we can't handle this rising temperature only by installing mechanical cooling, uh, like on this picture, even if it's very energy efficient. And although there is a large focus on energy in, in innovative modern cooling installation, this is not the sustainable way to handle this matter. So we really have to look at the initial carbon emission and not only the energy perspective. And if we look at hospitals, we can see that uh, if we look at the initial carbon emissions, uh, almost 23% of the initial carbon emissions come from installations where cooling is one part. And, and when we talk about initial carbon emissions, almost 50% uh, of the total carbon emissions up till 2050 in new construction will be from, from initial carbon emissions. And I don't have the statistics from cooling, but when looking, for example, on ventilation systems, the carbon footprint from installing and replacing parts of the ventilation system over lifetime can vary between uh, the different types of ventilation systems with almost 70% in regards to initial carbon emissions. Uh, so it's really important that we choose the right uh, installations and cooling systems also from initial uh, carbon emission perspective. The other part that I would like to talk about is uh, is from uh, from uh, to to secure that that we don't let the heat into the building, and that is both from a, a energy perspective, but also from a a uh, initial carbon perspective. Uh, we know that uh, that uh, the built environment uh, are heat islands. You can see on this graph that the in downtown areas, the heat, both daytime and nighttime, is much higher than if we look at, for example, rural areas, but also if we look at park areas and suburban areas. And uh, this is, is due to um, park areas, rural areas and suburban areas having more green areas and trees. Uh, we can also see that if we uh, look at the temperature, air temperature and surface temperatures in different parts of the cities, for example, on the right side, we have a picture from Winnipeg. Uh, it's in the same area, two blocks away from each other, one area with green uh, areas and a lot of trees. The temperature is uh, 32.7 degrees and in an area with no trees, it's 40 and a half degrees. So, from an architectural perspective, it all starts when we are planning, uh, in this case, a hospital. Because a hospital need a lot of space and it also creates a lot of surfaces. Uh, and this we have to work with. So working with the area uh, when planning and designing new hospitals, uh, it provides us uh, with yet another reason, the temperature issue provides us with yet another reason to plant trees and develop green areas but also to contribute to um, uh, not having the city becoming to heat island by avoiding surfaces that are black. Uh, for example, the parking lots where we can use other materials, but also the building itself where we can work with, with uh, other colors than, than black and dark colors and use uh, lighter colors. Uh, on the building, on the roof, we can work with uh, uh, roof, green roofs that support, support not only lower temperatures, but also supports biodiversity, cleans, handles, rainwater, etc. And we can also see that by using lighter colors, and in this case, on this picture, a very innovative color that reflects 98% of, of the sunlight energy, we can lower the need of, of cooling in, in buildings. From an architectural perspective, uh, working with, with the window facade ratio is an important part, securing that we both get good daylight into the, the, the building, but securing that the sunlight don't give an extra heat load. Uh, and as we see on the right uh, hand picture uh, on the upper, uh, we can see that 
doing a analysis in an early stage identifies where we will have problems with heat. Uh, it also identifies where we have challenges with daylight. And by having this as a, a decision platform, we can decide on how much window areas we need in the bottom floor and in the upper floor, and thereby balancing the, uh, the heat from the sunlight. Uh, we can also work with, on the left side, we can also work with placing uh, rooms and functions of, uh, of, uh, of the building that have a lot of internal heat emitting equipment on the north side where we don't have as much daylight and using the, the south side for uh, 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 functions that need a lot of daylight. Uh, another area is sunscreening that's really important. Also, again, not securing that we don't get it too dark in, on the inside during fall and winter, uh, but during summertime secures that we don't get the, the energy load from the sunlight uh, coming into the buildings. So sunscreening is also a very important area. Lastly, I would just lift a little area where we also can work with temperature and it's when choosing the materials on the inside of the building. And this is a really important development area, uh, looking at materials that actually have a good thermal performance. In this case, uh, wood is one of those that's really interesting, but also on the right hand side, we have new materials like, like hempcrete, et cetera, that, uh, that shows uh, some really interesting thermal performances. So that was all uh, in regards to cooling from an architectural perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I would like to introduce the next um, uh, presentation uh, company here, uh, Eon Ectogrid, uh, Mats Karselid, who's uh, uh, with us in, in the studio today. Uh, and he will look in, more into district cooling and how that can be an opportunity. Uh, change slides. Welcome, Mats. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Mats Karslid. I uh, work as solution designer within Ectogrid. Ectogrid is a part of Aeon, and I will today speak about Ectogrid, what it can do in, <clears throat> in systems. My, my background is, uh, I've been many years with Alfa Laval, um, uh, and then I work for an Italian industrial group called Louvre, uh, but in, in short, I've been working with district heating, district cooling, uh, a lot of data centers, mission critical, which goes hand in hand with hospitals. And now it's a system instead of a, a product. So Ectogrid is, um, it's all about sharing uh, waste heat, taking care of what we typically take up through the roof with, with cooling towers or chillers or uh, dry coolers. So it's all about um, uh, reusing uh, heat and cold. So Ectogrid is, is one system, so it's a two pipe system for both heating and cooling. In traditional district heating, district cooling, you need four pipes. Here we have two pipes. Uh, it's, uh, it's using standard components. It's a decentralized production of heating and cooling with the help of uh, cooling machines and, and heat pumps. Uh, it is a low temperature grid. So when we speak about the hot pipe, could be 20, 25, 30 degrees, which is not hot, but we help it with, with, uh, with heat pumps. And the cold pipe could be 5, 10, 15, maybe 20, uh, 20. So it's a low temperature grid. We call it fifth generation of this heating, but it's, it's Ectogrid. So <clears throat> Ectogrid, how does it work? So on the picture here, we have uh, houses with a mixture of heating and cooling need. Uh, so for instance, the, the, the building to the left is, is having heating need. They have a heat pump. The heat pump will, will fetch hot from the hot pipe and give away cold to the cold pipe. The neighbor building in the middle is having a cooling need. It will fetch uh, cold from the cold pipe and give away hot to the hot pipe. Again, it's not really hot. It's more uh, lukewarm, we could say. Uh, 
So Ectogrid is all about sharing waste heat and waste coal that could have gone up in, in the air with, with, with dry cooler cooling towers and so on. On the right side, we have what we call the active balancing, which is excess heat, boreholes, geothermal, heat pumps, connecting with district heating and district cooling networks. So it's very much of a Lego thing that you can mix and match what you want. If I break it down more in pieces, so we have a low grid temperature, uh, low temperature grid. And because of that, we have very small losses. When we have 25 degrees in the ground and we transport water, maybe a kilometer, we don't have any losses of high magnitude like this with heating is having traditional, maybe 80, 90, 100 degrees. We have small losses and we have plastic pipes that are not insulated. If we look at the buildings, again, it's a decentralized production. So we have heat pumps and shillers and decentralized pumping. So we don't have a big boiler house that pushes out a lot of heat. We have some buildings within Nectarid that is having a joint uh, need of cooling and heating at the same time shared energy. Thermal storage, the ground can work as a, um, in Swedish um, uh, thermos, thermos uh, thermal flask uh, to, to store energy, uh, to store heat uh, and, and cold. A tank is needed. This tank can be, can be small, but it can also be big or, or in between. It's, it is to, to, to feel the balances of the houses, depending on if there is a heating need or a cooling heat or, heat or a joint heating and cooling need at the same time. And on the right side, we have what we call the active balancing. Uh, if we have uh, uh, too much of a, a heat in the system or too much of a cold in the system, then we put, then we add with, with what we call the active balancing. Now I've been speaking about ectogrid. But behind this is also the smart system, the software, the, the, the fine tuning, which we'll call EctoCloud. So EctoCloud is behind and backing up this with artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, machine learning. So when I speak about EctoGrid, I speak about EctoGrid and EctoCloud is very important. So EctoCloud is able to feel uh, certain things. It's able to feel the temperatures of the shillers, the temperatures of the heat pumps, the working of the pumps for circulation, the temperatures in the surrounding. It feels that it, it learns that in a certain house, the water usage in the morning starts at six o'clock. In the neighbor house, it starts 6.30. It feels that in two hours, the temperature outside will maybe go down five degrees because of a heavy shower. So EctoCloud is making these, um, these um, uh, calculations and act, acting uh, correspondingly. EctoCloud is, is, is a digital platform which is adjusting the temperatures to improve the COP values. And, and it, it, it has the possibility of sensing that now we have a lot of um, wind power available or solar power. So it's, it's the control system behind. So why choose Ectogrid? It's a two-in-a-one system. It minimizes the uh, supplied energy. It's reducing the energy cost. It's not a hocus-pocus thing. It's standard components. The biggest Ectogrid is right now in Lund, which call it Medicom Village. And this is Medicom Village. It's an old AstraZeneca plant. And I invite you all to come and look. I, I could take you there, take you on a guided tour. It's not the hospital, but it reminds about hospital. And this is the buzzwords, 15 commercial and um, residential buildings, a 35% uh, 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 less usage uh, of, of supplied energy and a very happy customer. And now I realize it was out. Uh, this is related to my sliding deck. So Medicom Village is uh, the biggest ectogrid right now with 15 connected buildings with a mixture of heating and cooling. So yeah, that's extra really in short. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so we'll go quickly through the presentations uh, and we'll have the questions in, in the end. Um, 
so I would like to introduce the next speaker. It's uh, Thomas Lindborg from Lind Invent. Welcome, Thomas. I push the correct button. So, hello, my name is Thomas Lindborg. I'm the CTO and CCO of Lind Invent. And I'm going to talk about the innovative, sustainable indoor climate control. Uh, and <clears throat> what this is all about is we make a difference for the climate. And it's not about just indoor climate. If we do it well, we also take care about the outdoor climate. And what we do is indoor climate control, lighting control, sun shading control, space management. And by doing so, we actually provide our end customers with the lowest cycle, life cycle cost solutions with minimal energy use, comfort and productivity. And as we have working with more air, we also provide them with better and safer, safer workplaces. And if we do so, then we actually do value adding properties that is good for the organization. So they just don't stay at home because then they're not a team, then they're single players. So we do this in schools, offices, laboratories, and now we're talking primarily about healthcare. So we're gonna dig into that. This is what it looks like when you would like to wash your hands, but the water is not running all day because you would like to wash your hands every now and then. But when you look at buildings, the lighting is very often on without any people present. The ventilation is also on, on a high level without people being there. And the temperature is more or less constant regardless of people are there or not. So what can we do about that? Well, demand control usage is our take on that. And what we do is provide the system with more sensors, more intelligence and more control, control algorithms to make them more energy efficient. And so we are looking at demand control ventilation. That is our primary, primary area. And uh, without having to know Swedish, you could have a look at the investment here that VAV, which is actually variable air volume, have, has the lowest investment cost compared to CAV provided by chill beams or VAV with chill beams. And then there are many different institutes or um, st students or uh, universities that have been doing things on this, trying to calculate what is the actual, the lowest system solution life cycle cost. And if ASHRAE does this, it's also very apparent that VAV has the lowest life cycle cost and LCSFYASHILA means cooling. So the blue part of the bar is also the lowest with this solution with VAV. So it seems to be a good thing. So we thought, okay, why is that? And here in our system, we are possible, to, it's possible to to actually measure the power going to the radiators for heating, the used cooling power in the room, the purchased cooling power, the electrical power for the lighting, electrical power for the tenant, and electrical power for the fan going from the, trying to provide the airflow. And here we're comparing one room with person in it and a person without it. And you see the big difference in the power energy used for different solutions based on if you have demand controlled or not. So <coughs> we are focusing on this, as I said, and this is the traditional solution to do that. We have a damper, we have an actuator and controller and most possibly a room sensor and a occupancy sensor. And this needs a silencer and a diffuser. We do it like this. All of it, what you have to the left is to the right and even more. And this has a better technical specs than what you have to the left. So we won a couple of prizes with this. And a year or two years ago, we came up with a newer version of this that is even better. And this one is extremely quiet, has a wide airflow range. There's no need for straight ducts for measurements, valve with variable permeability, which means we can have a very, very high pressure drop without causing noise. And <clears throat> the self-adjusting opening, which I will show in the picture, is the thing that makes it possible to work with really cold air, which means less heating and then actually less cooling. And the installation, the sensors, the Bluetooth, it's in the connection, but it's easy to make it the best of the best. So with this valve that you have here to the left, we can actually have a pressure drop up to 200 pascals without causing any noise. With these plastic uh, lamellas inside this um, damper or solution uh, is more or less some kind of an airflow damper that is totally mechanic. 
without any kind of electricity that which is, makes it possible to have cold air without causing any problem with draft, even with as low temperature as a delta T of 10K. And that is something that actually gives us the possibility of reducing the heating needed in the building. Here you see heating for water, heating for when it's getting colder outside, then we need to have more warmer and warmer because of different old style solutions. With our solution, it actually looks like this. And that, the old way of doing it is reduced. We can buy less power for heating and also at the lower cost. The sensors inside of it are a lot. We have an occupancy sensor, we have a temperature sensor to the right here for the room. We have a airflow sensor. We have a temperature sensor in the duct. We have possible uh, a light sensor and a Bluetooth communication chip. And on top of that, we can have CO2, relative humidity, VOC, formaldehyde, all of that applied in a way that even well Institute uh, thinks okay. All of this is listed. For those who are crazy about technical gadgets, you will love this. This is applied in the building that you see here, Psychiatry Huset up north in Ulmio, and the Swedish building regulation says an energy consumption of this, the specification of a certification system says this, and but Psychiatry Huset in Ulmio, they do this. So it says quite a lot of this is actually working and it's really, really good. Another thing, um, uh, the first speaker, I can't recall your name, but sorry, uh, we're talking about chill beams. We can actually pimp your old CIV beams, me and making them VIV, saving energy, getting better in the climate control, digitalization, and you are also able to, to recycle your beams, not throwing them away. Talking about this the thing that Pal was talking about, that your carbon footprint of what you install needs to be as low as possible. And then the slide that he showed about that, the thing, the solutions to the right with the lowest carbon footprint was actually exactly what we are installing. Another thing that sun shading is if you have a really good fabric with a metallic outside, you can reduce the <clears throat> need for cooling quite a lot. So by using our system for sun shading control with all functions that is connected with the sensors inside of the diffuser, you can reduce energy need for cooling and also visualize this in an intuitive way, making it easier for the technicians running the systems, handling it in the most efficient way. So that is more or less the ending with this perfect, fantastic visualization of a floor plan of uh, those awnings on a building in Stockholm is all that I have to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas. Um... Yeah, I think uh, we'll have a different. Yeah, we are, we are having a different companies with us here, so it's very interesting to see the different views and and uh, how we can look at from a system perspective on on how to solve the the, the cooling need at hospitals. Um, I would like to introduce the next speaker. It's uh, Kenneth Andersson from Climate Machines. Welcome. Thank you. So, uh, my name is Kenneth Andersson, and I'm from, sorry, Climate Machines. We're part of Energy Machines Group. Uh, Climate Machines uh, is a designer and supplier of air handling units. And I will talk a little bit how, uh, about how we use our heat exchanger as a cool exchanger with uh, something we call indirect evaporative cooling. And this is actually what it's all about. Uh, we have, in this example, an outside air temperature of just above 32 degrees. And after our heat exchanger, we have 21.6 degrees. And that's without chillers, district cooling, or any heating cooling pump. So the question is, what is the value of this? And uh, I'm not gonna dig very deep into the technology. I want you all to think about the value of this and, and how that could be used with integrating with other technology. So in our air handling unit, we have the heat exchanger and it's, an, it's not a rotating one. It's not a coil heat exchanger. It's a cross flow heat exchanger 
in two steps. We have some very important uh, features in our heat exchanger that makes it possible to use it as a cool exchanger. One very important thing is we have zero risk of contamination. Thanks to unique placement of fans, uh, we have no risk of transmitting odor, infections, or water, uh, which means that we can recycle kitchen airs, labs, and infection clinics. Uh, and this is a big step for us uh, to have our air handling units used in, in hospitals. Another very important thing for us is uh, our heat exchanger of recycled plastic. So it gives us a smooth surface with minimal risk of freezing and with using indirect evaporative cooling, no risk of corrosion. This is the recycled plastic. I think it's fun to show this picture. It shows that we have recycled plastic from, from different type of productions uh, from the factory. This is spill material that will could not be used in, in, in other uh, produced plastic parts. And to get the heat exchanger work as a cool exchanger, we need high efficiency in our heat exchanger. So with 90% efficiency, of course, in winter, that's where you save the most in the operation operating cost. And I've been working with this technology for 15 years. And in the beginning, it was only talked as a heat exchanger. But as you know, the last couple of years, with I think the, the extreme summer of 2018, uh, our feature uh, with indirect evaporative cooling has been the number one unique selling points for our air handling units. And that's uh, not only in South Pole Sweden or, or Europe, it's also in the very north of Sweden, the demand for cooling is, is increasing rapidly. So indirect evaporative cooling, uh, what is that? Uh, easily described uh, in, a, in a hot summer day, 30, 35 degrees outside, you gladly take a swim in the water. And uh, when you get up, the wind is blowing on your wet skin and you feel the cooling effect when the water is evaporating. And um, maybe you also have the same problem as me. When I take a shower, I always freeze afterwards. Um, same effect with the water evaporating on your skin. And we use that technology in our air handling unit. Uh, it's very important that you remember the name indirect evaporative cooling. Uh, and indirect means we don't evaporate the supply air. So we don't add moisture or water into the supply air. We use the high performance of the heat exchanger by cooling down the return air before we use it uh, in our cool exchanger. So it's the return air that we evaporate with a very fine water moisture uh, sprinkler system. And um, we use it when the outside air temperature is about 22 degrees and warmer. Under 22 degrees, uh, it's better for us to completely bypass the outside air temperature uh, and let the nature uh, do uh, what it can. The, the, the performance of the evaporative cooling is, is very low uh, in temperatures under 22. But 22 and rising, the cooling efficiency of our heat exchanger or cooling exchanger is increasing with the outside air temperature. And Back to this picture, this is a couple of days in the uh, end of October, middle of, middle of August uh, this summer. So the green line you see is the outside air temperatures of nine to 10 days. And as you see this week, 
where you know has been a, a normal week the last summers uh, we're getting used to this high peak increasing outside air temperature with uh, um, with with problems uh, in all buildings uh, the capacity of cooling is is uh, in many places in sweden not enough uh, and um, you, you notice everyone is running for for buying their own chiller or fan fan uh, to their houses but this this has been the new normal uh, 2018 was a extreme year but every every summer since that we had this weeks more and more and uh, what you see here is that this is what we do. We, we cut completely the, the need of, of cooling by, by changing the outside air temperature to down to 22 degrees. All these peaks is cut down. And the question is, what, what is it? What is the value of this? Uh, I can give you some examples in, in, in new building, design new building, when you design a cooling heating system, climate machines, air handling units, uh, more or less pays for itself. Thanks to the cut of this cooling peaks, but also the heating peaks uh, uh, in, in winter time, which could mean fewer and smaller cooling heat pumps. If you have that kind of cooling system designed, uh, fewer boreholes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in existing buildings, you could renegotiate with district cooling supplier uh, by when it's time for, for adding new chillers. Uh, the old ones are, are, are old, and you could reduce the number of chillers. Uh, and in many buildings, uh, especially administration buildings in hospitals, but also homes for care homes for elderly people, most of those doesn't have any cooling at all. And, and with this, you can add comfort cooling without any extra installation. Okay, so can it, yeah. uh, we need to- uh, Yeah, this is a sum up speaker. thing. This is a sum up thing. So yeah. That's my last slide. Uh, I'm adding up to the sum up. So yeah, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Kenneth. Uh, we will have time to ask you more questions uh, dur during the Q and A. Um, so I would like to represent the next speaker, and it's uh, Niklas Berglöv from uh, Klimacheck. Welcome, Niklas. Thank you very much. I'm just starting the, um, the share of the screen. You can see, I hope. Yeah, thank you very much for all the good presentations. It's super interesting for me that is very snowed in on, on only one, one area. So I'm Niklas from Klimacheck. I work mainly with, uh, yeah, we work with optimization of cooling systems and then especially chillers, refrigeration, heat pumps as well. What they called, I think, uh, Victoria called it compressor or compressor vapor efficiency. So yeah, let's start. Cooling system consists of I mean, air conditioning, refrigeration, heat pumps. These units or these systems consume 20% of the global electricity and increasing like Kenneth said, like everybody want, it's get hot, uh, we want more cooling. And in buildings, it's 30 to 60% of the electricity. And um, in hospital, these systems are business critical. If you lose your cooling, you lose your indoor temperature, you need to cancel surgeries, you can lose vaccine, you lose the dehumid dehumidification. So they are critical to keep, I mean, running good. And as we saw in the before here, that a lot of people actually think they are running good, which I found really interesting. The potential, saving potential, we usually find is 10 to 30 percent of the one of the biggest electricity consumers in buildings. And those savings or this saving potential actually also consists of um, you can reduce failures by fixing the saving potential. And 10 to 30 percent is quite a lot. And how can I say that 
we are that is the potential it's in general not all system but we rarely find a system that run perfect so klimashek have been around since 2004 we focus only on the performance in shillers and the one part of the system and since 2007 we have connected the system to our cloud platform klimashek online where we analyze performance nowadays a lot of the sensors are available so we are going more and more to data communication or server to server apis and we are looking into more than 1000 systems today all over the world we are crunching 20 million data points every day sending back information on performance so why is this inf information crucial normally when you look on a cooling system you have everything from distribution to the black box Com commonly you are looking on the distribution ventilation how are we getting the right temperature in the rooms we are looking into the source of the temperature or so to say and opening up the black box so we can see how efficient is the temperature created or it's not created but how efficient do you get your temperature and this is very important because today performance or if you have the right temperature people consider the system running good which is a huge misconception because you can have the right temperature even if the system runs inefficient so what we do is that we look on the system efficiency and we have cre created system efficiency index which looks on first the whole system how efficient is the system and then if you have an efficiency or an inefficiency you would see on a component level how much energy are we losing what component need to be fixed do we have overcharge undercharge system is the compressor uh, losing efficiency so this gives you a roadmap directly to where is the problem and what needs to be done to be fix it and this of course makes it possible to avoid, avoid failures, avoid breakdowns, so you can keep on your critical business. And we can see that, that this transition from conventional or the normal business as usual, where you act on schedule or you have someone arriving fast if a system goes down, it's moving on to more of a digitalization of business as usual. You want to work condition-based. How is the system running? Are you losing performance? That should be when you go there, not when the system fails. And I mean, you see, we talked about the heat waves earlier. It's a system runs bad long before the heat wave, then the heat wave will cause it to fail. So there is a very important to always have the performance information. We are working with hospitals all around the world, helping them everywhere from North America. We are connecting quite a lot hospitals in Europe at the moment due to the electricity crisis or energy crisis. Africa and Asia is also connecting hospitals. So we are very used to work with them. And the result, when you actually have information and start to act on it, this, I have two examples. One is from Akademiska Hus in Stockholm. They installed a new cooling system. For us, a chiller is the same in a data center, in a hospital, it's the same units. Uh, they installed it and then started to use it. A part of the project was that we were going to look at the performance. So after installation, we looked at it, could see that there was a lot of potential. They reduced the energy consumption with 26%, brand new chiller, and by making sure it runs good. Same thing with the, of course, the energy goes down, this case 70,000 kilowatt hours a month. Another one is MACD Medical Center in USA. They have three chillers cooling 73,000 square meters. They optimize the system based on our information. So they are saving $24,000 a year and reduce the power consumption with 400,000 kilowatt hours a year. So what happens if you look on a wider scale on a whole hospital chain? Banner Health have done this. Uh, so they have connected 25 hospitals and gone through the first, in the first phase of optimization or the first 10 hospitals, they have reduced the power consumption with 14 million kilowatt hours a year, saving almost $4 million a year. And this is good, but what's even better is that they are keep on using all this analyzing, ensuring that the system runs good. 
So the partner in this are monitoring all the parameters needed and can in that way avoid problems, avoid failures. So by doing this, they could fix failures, uh, fix problems and reduce, um, um, prevent problems that would have cost over 130,000 increased electricity bill. So it's a very good opportunity to include also the shielders and heat pumps in this digitalization and connecting all the systems to avoid sub-optimizations. I've added some more information that will be in this that when Johannes sent it out, but that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Niklas. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this was the last uh, company presentation. Uh, and now we'll go to our colleagues at uh, Belloc. They will uh, give us introduction to their total, methodolo total methodology um, uh, method uh, and uh, how to approach uh, the challenge with uh, cooling and energy efficiency at hospitals. Yeah, so I have gotten the job to run this up and uh, sum this day up uh, from the presentation part of you. And we will take sort of a, a sidetrack, but still be within the area. As concluded earlier, the need for cooling will be increasing. Therefore, there is a need to improve the energy efficiency at existing hospital, not just building smart when we are building something new. So how could we do that? Well, one way is to use the total concept. So what is it and what does it do? Uh, many building owners face the dilemma of needing to improve their buildings, energy efficiency and standards while still living up to the different financial goals. And a way to address is via the total concept as is called in English or total methodique and as is called in Swedish. The total concept is a method and a financial tool designed to improve your energy performance in an existing building, non-residential building aiming to ensure maximum energy savings with still fulfilling the company's demand for profitability. And this can sound very academical, but the methodology is highly commercial. Uh, the methodology has been developed at the network of non-residential real estate owner in Sweden called Bildak, as Victoria mentioned, and we are representing here today. And Bildak is a collaboration between Swedish energy agency and both public and private real estate owners. Today, there is over 28 members representing over 30% of the domestic non-residential floor area, such as office, school, and healthcare in Sweden. So we have a good uh, base of uh, building owners here. And the group works with different development projects, and the goal is to share good experience with other real estate owners and other actors, such as companies presented here today. But back to the total concept and cooling. So when you aim to improve the cooling system, you need to overhaul other systems as well. As we heard in the last presentation, the heating system, insulation, window status, regulation system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can't just not look at the cooling. And if is isn't, if it isn't done, you can get problems with, for example, simultaneous cooling and heating, overheating, cool, overcooling areas and other problems. And if you get these problems, the, the persons using the buildings, the staff, the patients will have a discomfort and they will complain. If a building manager needs to improve the cooling system, the total concept can be used to identify all the measures that would be profitable or even necessary to do together with these changes. The method has been used in different care facilities in both Sweden and other Nordic countries with good results. Some examples is at Akademiska sjukhuset in Uppsala, at Salgriska University Hospital in Gothenburg, at Norrlands University Hospital and Ulo Center of Healthcare Station in Finland. 
So what is the total concept? Well, instead of focusing on individual measure, the method applies a comprehensive approach to the working with energy issues in a building. And this through identifying and carrying out package of measures, you can achieve a larger energy efficiency, but still fulfilling the building owner's demand for the profitability. And how is this done? Well, the method has three steps. And the main step is the first step, where an action pack is developed from a careful analysis of the building's status today. As you look at a broad range of different energy measures and you should identify them and evaluate them. The evaluation includes calculation the saving potential, the life cycle cost, and preferable, we would like to use the internal rate of return because it's a very good tool. Uh, you take all these measures and then you set a goal for your energy performance after you have uh, carried out these measures. And in step two is what you do. You do a renovation project or a bigger installation project. And then the most important thing is to learn and evaluate. And in the third step, you follow up the result from both the energy users point of view, but also from the project cost of view. So you can see if this was really profitable, and then you can take those savings and put them into other projects within your building stock. This was just a short introduction to this methodology. And we were talking about this here today because it has been a buzz about this, uh, uh, our uh, company leader uh, or boss was presenting this to uh, in Italy to uh, different uh, hospital owners. And it's, it's really a good tool to start if you don't really know where to start. Uh, if you want to learn more, there is information available in Swedish, English, Danish, Finnish, Estonian, and Norwegian. And all of this land, which is, is due to the EU project, uh, the total concept. And you can find this, uh, this information on the webpage here. And if you speak Swedish, uh, you can find more at blog.se. And we also arranged two introduction of seminars to this uh, methodology this fall, but they are only available in Swedish. And this was all we had to say about this part. Uh, you can read a little bit more in the report. Okay. So thank you, Karin. Um, I hope you all had um, get some good uh, new ideas for, for um, what you can look into for your hospitals and uh, your projects, uh, whether it's a refurbishment or new hospital projects. Uh, we wanted to cover everything from how to construct the hospital to from a cooling perspective um, to the indoor ventilation climate and how to create the cooling for free and uh, how to uh, um, uh, monitor and uh, make it uh, the system more effective. And also now for the Belloc uh, method to uh, look how to approach uh, the challenge. And uh, yeah, so it, the, um, we'll move uh, forward to, to the Q&A section here. Um, I know we have some, um, representatives from, from the hospitals that has been mentioned and that are mentioned in, in the report. Um, so you, you, can, we, you can ask questions to, to, uh, uh, to the hospital side and also to the company side. And Karin, I, I know you, you had um, you have been in contact with some of the hospitals and maybe you can introduce um, some questions uh, as a next step. Um, I, maybe I can do it because <laughs> uh, um, actually one project that we highlighted in the report is about a new cooling system at uh, Ryhov and uh, I happen to know that um, at least I hope yeah I happen to know that uh, Hans Djurbeck um, who is property developer for that county Jönköping is here today um, hi. So I just, hi. <laughs> so I just uh, wanted to ask you a um, question. Uh, so according to you, uh, what is the most important uh, factor for a good cooling system at the hospital? Um, there are 
of course many important factors for um, a cooling system but um, as you mentioned earlier it's important for us to have a flexibility in the system uh, where flexibility means that we can change between different types of cooling production over time and uh, also of course that the system is energy efficient Perhaps someone wants to, because I know that there are people from other hospitals as well. So feel free to, um, yeah, give your speak up what you think. <laughs> do you agree, or do you have some some other aspect that you think is important? Otherwise, we have uh, other questions as well. If you have have time, Hans. Yeah, and uh, maybe we have some from from the audience that have questions. You can also ask them. Hasse, you ones who always have something good to say. Please speak up, Hasse. Or Elvis has okay, just yeah, I, then, then we'll go to the chat. Um, we can start up here. Um, uh, a question to all. The red, the <laughs> <laughs> Thomas. Ah, okay. Welcome in. I had to go hit the knappen. Yeah, man, I think I'm going to say. När man kombinerar vissa av de här så uppnår man ju väldigt yeah. goda resultat. So, sorry Hans, can you, can you take it in English? Yeah. When you combine some of these solutions, you ha have very good results. If you combine Linden vent with energy machine, you don't need any heat to the ventilation system and you take away the peak load from the cooling system and this solution with linear vent and energy machine in combination with the geoenergy balanced turbical network is the solution on the uh, in the psychiatry house in Umeå. Yes, I, I know you have you have worked with this uh, it's a system solution um, how how were you thinking during this process? Yeah, I, I think uh, very much a lot of people they look at se uh, separate uh, technical solutions like linear vent, like uh, climate machines, something else. But the in most important thing is how you build the system, how the SIP different techniques work together and just linear vent and the climate machines solution they marry themselves very well i sorry i'm not so good to speak english but i hope you understand a little hey, it's perfectly fine thank you very much hans uh, do we have anyone from another hospital maybe that have uh, some comments about how you have be, uh, like approached the, the um, cooling challenge, how to create resilient and, and uh, yeah, cheap free cooling? Otherwise we can go to some questions in, in the chat. Uh, question to all, uh, the relation between saving CO2 and saving money, is it all money or is it CO2 a genuine interest uh, in healthcare? What do you say from um, maybe the company perspective? What, what do your uh, customers say when... when uh, what um, is the mission that you should solve when you approach a, a hospital? Am 
Mats, would you like to? But maybe you can you can come forward. Yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. I be her? Yeah. Can uh, if, if, if I for a second not speak about a hospital, but something that is a little bit similar, meaning data center, which is also mission critical, they have pyramids of money, but they care very much about the green aspects. I, I just came home from Holland uh, for a similar event in, in Amsterdam yesterday, and and uh, in a certain area, data centers come in and they buy all the green atoms, all the green energy. And they take so much. So for the for the people and companies, there is no green electricity left. Uh, so there is a movement against you know data centers, and they they have so much waste heat. So that that that, that answer from a data center perspective is they care very much about CO two. They have tons of money, so money is not the, the case here. And how how is it with uh, hospitals? I have. Two little data points on, on hospitals to, to give that answer. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hospitals are also, you know, sort of a private funding, at least in Sweden. So my belief is less less money is floating around in hospitals in Sweden versus data centers. Thank you. Um the next question. Uh, who, what role is um, or uh, is or should be in charge of a sub optimization in hospital buildings? Donny, would you like to explain that? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, is it to Niklas? Yeah. Oh, is it to me, Niklas? <laughs> yes. I mean, I, th I think Hans. Uh, I mean, both Hans and Mats are. I mean. I think it's really important to see that it's not the, how to say it, it's not a single action, a single thing you need to do. Like you need to be all the way from the start where you plan the building and then keep keep making sure that the system runs good. I would say it's obviously easier to get money where you can when you can estimate um, when you can estimate. I mean, if you save money, you can have a return of investment. Just pure CO two saving or carbon emission savings not all companies have a cost or a set cost for this per ton, so to say. So, so I would say it goes very much hand in hand. The perfect person to say, I mean, uh, the last case I showed are actually from, the, it's actually started because they needed to cancel so much operation um, surgeries because when it got hot, the systems turned off because they were running inefficient. So. They they started from a stab, stability way side of it rather than an environmental side of it, and then they worked from that aspect. So I think, I mean, it's hard to say that there is a fixed person because as of today there is not like one single person that have the problem. I mean, even we are looking on systems where you have you use both the hot and cold side, like um, like uh, Eon described. Sorry, I don't remember your name uh, and you have one group responsible for the heating and one for the cooling in the same unit and one want to optimize it and one is not interested so i mean it's a very hard question to tell who to talk to but i would say the the one with the most pain and the biggest cost is uh, cancelled oper cancelled surgeries so it's it's like it's a weird start but i we've seen people energy optimization coming from that aspect when they understand the connection between I mean for my for Schiller so that reliable system is energy efficient so that goes hand in hand so it's uh, it's it's the energy people the operational people and the like the it's three or four persons you need to to have with you to do those projects but but I agree totally with Hans that it's not a discussion on one one solution basically you need all of them and then you just need to have start at one in one corner and then work your way out yes um i, I do also have a question it's maybe to to link architecture uh, and and um it's like how how is that is there a um, like, uh, division between making beautiful buildings and and uh the design aspect and uh, making the the hospitals 
you know efficient uh, and how 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 is that um, integrated into each other uh, well I, I think um, as architects our our main focus is to create uh, good environments uh, good buildings good architecture and function uh, for the people that use use buildings and uh, sometimes uh, uh, that comes in conflict with, uh, for example, a good example is the energy crisis in the end of the 70s and 80s, where small windows, uh, um, uh, thick walls, stuff like that, uh, created bad indoor uh, function for, for whatever purpose the building was built for. And today we see them being tear torn down due to that. Uh, so for us, uh, having a finding the balance between uh, uh, demands on energy efficiency, uh, cooling, uh, good indoor environment, temperature. Uh, we have to find the balance between letting, for example, daylight in and securing uh, low heat from sunlight and, and stuff like that. So, so that holistic approach, that balance is, is one of our challenges. Uh, it also, when, when um, looking at installations, cooling installations, ventilations, uh, it takes space, it takes uh, uh, floor height, it costs money and, and that balancing towards the quality for the people using the building uh, is always uh, a challenge for, for us as architects. Okay, thank you, Pat. Um, uh, yeah, so we, we're um, getting close to the end of this uh, webinar. Um, oh, sorry, no, it's a long slide. And I would, yeah, I would like to thank everyone uh, for participating, um, the speakers and also the audience. Um, we have the audience from uh, many different countries and also from hospitals and companies and different organizations. So it's very, very happy to have this um, uh, joint event between yeah, this uh, cross sectoral uh, arena in, in this uh, event as well. And uh, yeah, uh, I would like to uh, remind you again that we will uh, publish the report and we'll send it out in an email to all of you. Um, you can also visit our webpage and also the Beloc, our colleagues at Beloc, uh, so, so uh, to gather information about how to approach cooling within uh, hospital buildings. So, Diego, do you have anything more to say? And uh, no, no, thank okay. you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. To all of you and uh, we'll stop the, the recording now and if you want to ask more questions after you're welcome to do that okay thank you okay.